So, thanks Mingning and hello everyone. Good evening, my name is Daniel. Uh, and today I'll be giving a talk about what I learned from my first open source contribution. Uh, but specifically, it's an uh, open source contribution to a repository named Rubocop. Uh, so I'm going to start this talk off with a bit of a hand-raising exercise. So, um, okay, could you raise your hands if uh, you are a developer here with one year of experience or less? Okay, that's a few of us. Uh, another hand-raising exercise. If you are a developer with two years of experience or less, yeah, including the guys with the one year of experience or less. Okay, so it's about half of us. High five, me too. Um, raise your hands if you've used Rubocop before. That's almost everyone, great. And raise your hands if you've looked into the source code of Rubocop before. All right, so to be honest, I had a genuine fear that everybody in this room would have seen the source code before, and then I would have pressed the next slide, which is like, okay, thanks, I'm done with the talk. <laughs> but um, okay, cool, thanks. I just wanted to gauge uh, where you guys were at. So, uh, right, my name is Daniel. This is my Twitter handle, and that's my GitHub link. Uh, um, today, my talk will be centered around these two events. Uh, so last year, six months ago, in July and August, I managed to merge two uh, pull requests into Robocop. Um, but just to give you some context as well into what I used to do and why I decided to contribute to Rubocop. Uh, so I wasn't always a programmer. Uh, and in fact, these two contributions I made when uh, during my first uh, year mark as a, as a programmer. Um, and before that, I was actually a psychology graduate. Uh, and after I graduated from my degree, I was a secondary school teacher in Malaysia teaching history. So that's me. Uh, and after the, so it was a two year contract and after the two years ended, uh, I joined one of the coding boot camps where I learned Ruby on Rails for about three months. Uh, that's where I also got married. Uh, and then I moved over to Singapore. Uh, and then this company called Tinkerbox, they took me in as an intern. Uh, and eventually they converted me to a full-time programmer. And as a new programmer, I understood that there was a lot that I didn't understand. So I think that was my constant struggle in, in Tinkerbox. Uh, so one of the things that I tried to do in Tinkerbox was uh, to, to improve my programming skills was uh, I do a lot of like code challenges. So I made it a thing in Tinkerbox where we get together and discuss, uh, discuss code katas uh, on the site called Code Wars. Uh, it was a good way of, I think, learning the different libraries and methods that were available to Ruby. Uh, but I still felt dissatisfied with how much I didn't know. Uh, I felt that I still couldn't do a lot of things. And I think this was because I was trapped in this thing called the Rails bubble. The Rails bubble, uh, I described it to be like only exposed to like building apps in Ruby on Rails. So I, I view programming through the lens of Ruby on Rails. And then I was very bad at like novel problems. So if a more complex problem was presented or I don't know, some algorithms or something, then I would like completely trip up. So uh, then I had a talk with my CTO, uh, and he had a we had a yearly uh, annual one on one, and he pushed me to to like contribute to Robocop as like uh, my my short term plan. I think like it was my six month plan or something like that. So I was like, okay, fine. Uh, uh, and that was when I made my entrance to Robocop, and that's why I contributed to Robocop. So let's get the cat out of the bag first. So what is Rubocop? So if you're thinking this guy, the street cop, which I think his name is Murphy or something, right? Anyway. Uh, so basically, Rubocop is a Ruby static code analyzer uh, based on the community Ruby style guide. And it can do a couple of things. So uh, first of all, it can uh, help you to enforce a particular code style. So in this case, we have a method, and we have a return on the method A. And 
we know as Rubyists that all method definitions have an implicit return, so you don't really need to put a return there. Uh, so if you want to enforce this particular style of not using a return, you can, and then Rubicop, Rubicop will uh, highlight it as, a, as an offense. OK, uh, it can also suggest alternative methods from the Ruby standard library. So here we have a method. Uh, someone is trying to iterate through a hash, but he is only using the key and not using the value. So here Rubicop can flag that as well and tell you, well, you can use a method like hash each. And it can also auto-correct for you as well. So when Rubicop catches a particular offense, uh, you can run Rubicop using the Rubicop dash A option, which stands for autocorrect, and it can correct a, a few simple mistakes for you. Like, for example, it can get rid of the return, or it can even help you to indent your operators or something like that. So, when I uh, started to look into the Rubicop code base, I asked myself first okay, uh, the obvious question is how does Rubicop work? Um, how does it do what it does? So I looked into their code base, uh, and uh, these were the apparent or obvious uh, structures in their code base. So uh, I saw a folder named AST, which I knew nothing about, uh, COP, Formatter, and RSpec. And then I had inclination to go into COP, because that seemed like the most obvious thing. Like, well, that's probably where it keeps like, all its good logic. So I opened up uh, one of the COPs, and this is the hash each COP. Uh, and then I was like, oh my gosh, like, what is this? By the way, I, I see a lot of methods that I, I, I didn't understand. And um, I also wanted to make a quick diversion into this thing called C tags. So raise your hands if you use C tags. Uh, yeah, OK, cool. So uh, C tags, C tags. OK, so C tags is a, a library that creates a file that contains all the methods in a particular directory. And then it stores a reference to their definitions, right? So uh, then you can, so if you have a CTEX add on installed, you could just like hit a, a little shortcut key and then it pops you over to the method definition. And then the cool part is if you're using it with Ruby, you could run a simple executable uh, so that when you enter a new Ruby, uh, uh, sorry, Rails directory or Ruby directory or anything, uh, you could get it to run the CTEX reference file on all the gems in your gem file. So now if you see a weird method that you don't understand, you just like hit a button, and then boop, it goes to the method definition. So I didn't know this when I was uh, navigating through the Rubicop code base, but now I, I use it a lot, and it's very useful. So anyway, I go to that method, and uh, I decide to find out what this def node matcher is. And then uh, I see that, um, so Rubicop leaves a lot of like helpful comments on the methods to sort of tell you what it's doing, right? So I try to read the comments, and I still don't really know what's going on. Uh, but I notice, uh, you know, there's the AST acronym over there, right? And I'm like, OK, cool. And then I scroll to the top of the file, and I see like even more comments, which is excellent. And again, I see this like AST word, which I'm unfamiliar with. So at this point, I'm like, OK, what is this AST? And it must seem pretty important. So I did what any logical programmer would do. I looked it up on Wikipedia, of course. Uh, OK, so an AST, right? So an AST, I understand, is to be a tree uh, that represents the structure of your source code uh, with, this, with these nodes, right? So it tries to represent your source code in nodes. And it's very useful uh, to see like, you know, what's, what code are arguments that are being sent to other method calls, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you some sort of a sequence as to what is calling what and what is calling what. So on and so forth, right? So I read this and I dug a little deeper and I thought, okay, cool. So now, what does Ruby use the AST for? So as it turns out, um, when you write some Ruby code, it goes through a couple of stages before uh, it finally gets executed. Uh, so for example, here, uh, say this simple Ruby code puts two plus two. Uh, Ruby will first of all have to read it from left to right, character by character. So you'll read like P, U, T, S. And then you'll be like, oh, puts. Like, I know that. And then it tokenizes it. And then it reads two, and it's like, oh, I know that too. That's an integer. And then it tokenizes that. So uh, that is known as tokenizing. I, 
I forgot the puts, but you know it looks something like this. Um, okay, so now it's got a token. It's got some tokens, but uh, you know at this point you you could make a mistake in your code and it still wouldn't know because it hasn't tried to like call it sequentially. Like two perhaps should be called as an argument to plus on the receiver two, so two plus two. Uh, and this is what the next step is doing. It's sort of like parsing it, uh, giving it some sort of a sequence, right? And then once you've got this sequence, then um, it gets created or it gets translated to these like instructions, and these are called YARV instructions. Uh, uh, and this is, you know, I guess the the last bit before it finally gets executed as, as bytecode. So the bit that we are concerned with is here. This is this is the AST. Uh, so the tree that we saw just now on Wikipedia uh, can be sort of like this. So um, and I'll go into that in a bit. Uh, and then that bit there is the YARF instructions. Okay. So Ruby uses uh, this gem called Ripper to create its AST. But in Rubocop, Rubocop uses a different gem uh, called Parser. So different gem, but achieves the same thing. Uh, so to, you, you can all do this. You could just install gem install rip parser. Uh, and then you could use the Ruby parse, uh, you know, and uh, followed by the dash E for expression, and then key in the expression like 2 plus 2. And it will generate the, it's a bit small, I apologize. It will generate the AST for you. Um, so let's, let's look at this. Um, I call it Ruby parse twice. Uh, so it's a very simple expression. I call my method passing in argument 1. At the bottom, I call the same thing again with argument 1, but without the, without the parentheses. And we know we can do this in Ruby. But through the AST, it's very clear why. The ASTs are completely similar. So it doesn't distinguish between the uh, parentheses and, and no parentheses. And so we can understand, oh, OK, this is why the code executes the same way. Uh, here's another example. So here is my method that returns A. Uh, and let's just take a little uh, deeper look into the, into the AST, right? So uh, first, it's, it starts out with a define node. And the DEF node there. And uh, the way we read this is the define node has three children. Uh, the name, my method. The second child is the arcs, which is empty because my method accepts no arguments. And then the third child is a return, uh, which in turn has another child, which is a send on A. So we can see here how Ruby is making sense of the sequencing of this, of this piece of code. Uh, so then you try to play around with it to see how the EST changes. So like I try like okay, what happens if you try to return two values like A and B? Uh, and you notice that the code structure is still the same, except now as we expect, the return node has now two children: a send on A and then a send on B. So so far, so good. Uh, then I try something else. So I tried like A and then return B, and then we notice the EST changes a little bit. Uh, to deal with like the uh, you know two, two, the things that are happening inside the block, uh, a new begin node uh, has been introduced, and then now the begin node houses the send to A and then the return which sends B. So right now you must be thinking, great, what do I use this for, uh, or more specifically, like why the why do the ESTs matter in Rubicop, right? Uh, and as it turns out, it matters a, a whole lot. So, remember how I said that Rubocop, you could, it could suggest like alternative methods from the Ruby library. So, in order to do this, it must first of all be aware of what you're calling. Like, it has to know you're calling each on a hash, and you're not using maybe a key or a value. So, it has to know. So, let's take the same code and generate this EST. Uh, so, we see the define node, which has empty arguments, and then a huge block node as its child. And then in the block node, you see three children. The first is a send to each, and it is being called on the receiver, which is a send to hash. The second child, which is the arguments, is basically two children, an argument called key and an argument called value. And then the third one is just a, a send to do something with a local variable key, right? Now, how Rubicop knows what you're doing is it tries to just pattern match. So this you would find in most cops. You would find like a def node matcher. And then you would, you would put in these things. And 
if you were like me, when I first looked into it, uh, I wondered what the lines with the pattern was. Like, I was like, oh, what is that? So don't worry, that's just a, it's called a here doc. And it's basically, you can treat it like a string that has new lines inside. So you can just like, like a string literal, right? So you could just put it there. OK, so you try to construct a, a, a node matcher. Uh, and what you're actually trying to match is the shape down there. So it starts out with a block. And then you're trying to match a send on each. So you can see that part's similar. Uh, and then on the node matcher, we are trying to match anything. So not, so you can see the exclamation mark. So anything that is not being sent to an array. So not, not an array, basically. All right? uh, and then it must also have uh, two arguments, a key or a value. And in the node matcher, you see a underscore uh, k and underscore v. It means like a wildcard, right? So match anything. So you could, you could name it something else if you want. You could name it like key value, or you could name it like uh, index and something. It doesn't matter. As long as it sees two arguments, and you'll match that. So when Ruby matches this, then it'll be like, oh, OK, I have a case here. And then it then tries to call some methods to try to uh, either throw an throw a offense or, or auto-correct your code or something. OK. So what about auto-correcting, right? How does Ruby, or how does Rubocop auto-correct your code? OK, so here we have a very simple exp a few expressions. We have uh, the instance, uh, sorry, we have DEFN definition assigned to the instance variable definition. Uh, we have foo assigned to the instance variable source. And then we have some unrelated method call. And in Rubocop, uh, OK, so one of the things that it can do is it can autocorrect for style as well. So um, the equals operators in this code here, as you see, is not aligned. Uh, Rubocop can help you to align those as well. So what we can do is, um, well, we can parse it. But we can also parse in the extra option, the dash L or dash capital L uh, option. Uh, and what it does is, on top of uh, providing you the AST, it also uh, gives you uh, the definitions of the parts of that form the expression. So we can see in the first line, uh, definition equals to the instance variable definition. We can see that. Uh, it can, ident it can correctly identify where the operator is. Right? And so this is key. Uh, this is a piece of code that I did not write. This was written by White Quark in one of his articles in his blog. White Quark is the creator of uh, Parser. Uh, so I don't claim any credit for this code. I'm just mentioning what, what, what can be possible. So uh, he, on the right is the AST for the three lines of code we saw earlier. And on the left is uh, you know, a class that he wrote that inherits from uh, parser rewriter. OK, so first of all, on line two, it calls on begin, which means it's trying to match a begin block, a begin node, which it is, a begin node, so that matches. And then it says node children each, so it's just iterating through all the children. The begin node has three children, IVA assign, which is instance variable assign, LV assign, which is local variable assign, and then ascend to unrelated method call. So it says, OK, if the nodes are assignment nodes, then push them into an array. And so that's basically what it's doing. It's pushing the instance variable assign node and the local variable assign node into the array. Then it calls align on, those, on that array of nodes. Uh, what align basically does is it plucks out all the arrays again. It iterates through them. Uh, and then for each node, it calls this method lock, which I think is short for location. And then it calls dot operator to find where the operator is. And then it finds the column. So it can find out the exact column number that the operator is in. So now it's got an array of, op, of, of, uh, of column numbers. And then it just picks the maximum one. So it picks the operator that is furthest to the right. And then what the line at the bottom is doing is it's just inserting like white spaces before the operators to, to justify it. So if you run that uh, Ruby rewrite, uh, and then you put in the, the, the script, and you put in the expression. Then you notice that the equal signs are, are now um, justified. OK, so how does this all relate back to Rubocop? So actually, I mean, obviously, there's more to that. But uh, essentially, that's how all the cops work, right? So uh, take the hash each methods cop again. Uh, you have the def node matchers, which are just trying to catch particular types of patterns. In particular, it's trying to catch when somebody uh, calls each on a hash with two key values. 
uh, or is trying to catch uh, when you use something with keys, dot values, and then each. And it's trying to suggest uh, a, a method for that. And then you can also define uh, on block or amongst other any different types of nodes to say, OK, I want you to kick in when you see a block node that looks like this. Um, yeah. And that's it. That's, that's um, pretty much the, the, the core of what I learned about, about Rubocop. Um, this is, sorry, a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, so did it change my dissatisfaction, right? So I went through all that. Like, I was still dissatisfied. And like, now am I like, less satisfied? Uh, less, uh, no, more satisfied, OK. Uh, and then the short answer is like, no, not really, right? You don't just like morph into a beast overnight. Uh, but, but it got me started, I think. So uh, I started reading this book by, called Ruby Under a Microscope by Pat Shaughnessy. It's really good, and I highly recommend it. Uh, and that's what I've been doing, I think, for the past uh, few months. Uh, the book talks about the, the steps uh, that, that, that Ruby takes to finally execute your code, and it goes through it in detail. Um, I just want to share with you one extra learning I, I, I got from, from, from this book. Um, Oh, sorry, I want to share with you one extra thing from this book that happens on the compile uh, end, so the, the, the last bit, which I, which I thought was uh, quite intriguing. So um, this is a data structure called a stack. Uh, and I learned about the stack uh, you know, in my first year. And I knew that, OK, a stack is pretty much like an array. But you, know, you can only put stuff in from one side. And you have to take stuff out from the same side. So you've got some kind of like a last in, first out kind of a paradigm going on. And I'm like, OK, cool, that's a stack. but I. Don't really know what a stack is used for. Uh, I, I don't see how it is implemented, and I don't see how it's useful to me. Um, OK, so I, 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 I explored this. So here I have a piece of code at the top, 2 plus 2 plus 2. It's very simple. That's the AST. And uh, you could all do this as well. So you could call the Ruby VM class, instruction sequence. And then you could compile that code, and it will produce you this uh, YARV instructions. Okay. Uh, so when you look at the YARV instructions, then you could see um, basically what it's going to try to do is, is it reads from top to bottom. And then the first one first, uh, it's, it's going to put the first thing it sees into, uh, into the stack. Uh, so in this case, um, it, sees, well, it sees trace, and then it sees put object 2. So it's going to put 2 into the stack. And then it sees the next 2 is going to put 2 into the stack. And then the next one is quite cool. It sees operator plus. OK. And, uh, this is actually a, a, a optimization. But OK, so it sees operator plus. And what operator plus will try to do is it will look backward to the first two uh, things it sees. Uh, the, the one immediate to it is the, is the argument. And the one after is the receiver. So it says, OK, call plus uh, on 2 and to the receiver 2. And then it executes this. Uh, then it evaluates to 4. And then it continues again. So then the next thing it sees is 2. And the next thing it sees is plus again, and then it repeats itself, right? So then it's just like, oh, OK, receiver argument, and then, and then, that's, the, and then that's the end, right? So now I try to modify the sequencing by putting some brackets above. So now I do 2 plus bracket 2 plus 2, OK? Uh, and I notice that the YARV instructions are not too difficult. Just one thing changed, right? So now we see 2, 2, and then 2 again, right? And then it sees the operator plus. So plus is going to call the two things below it, the receiver, the argument. That's going to evaluate to 4. And that's basically our bracket up there, right? And then it sees the next plus, and then it, uh, and then it returns 6. So I thought that was pretty cool. Like This was a, uh, like the first time I've seen the implementation of a stack outside of a coding challenge, which like, uh, I could absolutely not relate to at all. Um, and then it led on to other things. Like for example, I was looking at JavaScript, and I keep hearing like JavaScript is async, JavaScript is async. But then like JavaScript has a synchronous call stack, so then how does it become async, right? And I won't go into that because this is not TalkJS. But um, but yeah, they do something really clever uh, with a queue, and uh, I would not have appreciated it if I like had not dived into this and, and, and looked at that. So I have a newfound appreciation for it. OK, so now I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, from this, I, I derive a lot more pleasure from my work. I don't think I've like, skilled up, but like, I, feel, I feel more happy, I think, doing my work. So that's, that's good. 
Uh, okay, and I have one last favor to ask of you. So uh, I, I, I used to be a teacher, and I very, I very, I value feedback. So I one more raise hands exercise. Could you raise your hands for me if you learned one new thing from this talk? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, guys. Okay, I'll be taking questions, but please go easy on me. Ah, I have not. Oh, well, okay. Uh, so my last uh, PR was in August, and then uh, I tried to look at more pull requests, and I realized that uh, at the time when I submitted the PRs, I didn't have a full understanding of how all of this worked. I kind of just like pulled myself through it. So I forced to reflect and dig deeper into what was going on, and um, so yeah, and this was the this it culminated in this in this talk. Uh, so. I'll be starting again. I just did one, but I just corrected the one, uh, one documentation, which is like one line of code and just changed some documentation. Uh, uh, did you have experience with uh, how RuboCop resolved the fancy syntax changes? So for example, when you call a method with a parentheses or without the parentheses, that is something which turns into the same ASM, I think. The ESD, how yeah. does RubyCop trace back it to the source code itself? Like suggesting that you don't have to use the parentheses, you can just call the function without it. Yeah, so um, you could call, uh, oh man, there's a method that you could call on it. So what Rubicop does is it, uh, it, it recreates its own node that inherits from AST node, and then it writes some wrapper methods around it to give it some superpowers. Uh -huh. uh, so one of the things it can do is it can, uh, call, the, it can call out the exact line uh, that, was, that, was, um, that was read. Uh, so yeah, then they, they can spot the parentheses. Mm. Okay, thanks. So like um, reading Pat Johnson's book, I guess that's getting lower level. Yeah. Right, maybe lower level than you had uh, coded that before. Does it make you, like how does that change your orientation? Does that make you more interested in coding closer to the method? Or, um, or does it just make you more appreciative of you know, how easy I'm very tempted to like open the C source files and try to look into it, but at the same time, there's a lot of inertia going into it as well. Um, I'm definitely more interested, but I'll have to think about when I want to allocate some time and go into that. I'm definitely interested to look into the coding closer to the metal. Yeah, but um, with that being said, like uh, I definitely have a newfound appreciation for Ruby and what what it does. All right, thanks very much, guys.